Plate Talk Podcast. I'm your host, Rob Port. On this episode, Shan- Representative Shannon Rourke Jones joins me to talk a little bit about her uh, medical, or I shouldn't say medical, marijuana decriminalization bill, which failed in the state house just before the legislature's crossover break. Representative Rourke Jones was not entirely happy with the process leading up to that. She talked about uh, committee hearings that were restrained in terms of, of, of allowing people to come in and testify both for and against her bill. Uh, and she also talked about, you know, it was, it was one of the last votes taken before the break. Uh, a procedure was put in place to, to not allow it to come back for reconsideration. Uh, it, it's, it's an interesting debate on an interesting topic. And the upshot is, as, as we learned in a previous episode of the show, that we're going to end up with another marijuana ballot measure on the ballot in 2020. But stay tuned for that. Before we get there, though, I actually have a new news story about the University of North Dakota and the way they pay some of their employees and a, an update on a story that I broke earlier this month. Uh, t- to the latter news first, uh, you all will remember uh, a a story I wrote about Angelique Foster. Now, Angelique was a an assistant to UND President Mark Kennedy. She had worked with him previously at George Washington University. Uh, she was his his special assistant up to the time when it was announced that she was going to be leaving the University of North Dakota. That was back in November of last year. All of a sudden, she got a promotion to chief of staff. She got a $30,000 a year raise. And flash forward to earlier this month, it was announced that she would be staying on at UND, only she would be working from Texas and would have a $25,000 a year allowance to travel back and forth, basically commuting from Texas up to North Dakota to serve as President Mark Kennedy's chief of staff. Now, I think most reasonable people would argue that this is not at all an efficient use of taxpayer dollars. The idea, as the university claimed that uh, this arrangement was still cheaper than hiring somebody else for the chief of staff position, they argue that they couldn't find anybody to work in that position for less than $189,000 a year. I just don't think that that passed that, 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 that passed the smell test. Anyway, flash forward to today, the University of North Dakota has announced that they are cutting ties uh, with Angelique Foster. She will uh, be continuing to work for UND until April. Uh, after that, she'll be working remotely for six months, and they'll be in the process of hiring a new chief of staff. This is from uh, my colleague, reporter Sidney Mook, writing in the Grand Forks Herald. I quote, While I still believe UND would benefit from the continuity Miss Foster would offer to UND, in the role of chief of staff, after listening to concerns, Ms. Foster and I have determined it is in the best interest for her to stay on working on campus until April and then work remotely for up to six months to allow for us to transition someone new into the role of chief of staff. Uh, we do not want this issue to continue to distract from the great work taking place at UND. Uh, so interesting development. Um, obviously, that's a story I broke, and I guess it's it's gratifying to see this outcome, but for me, the, the situation with Angelique Foster was just a symptom of a larger problem. For instance, a story I broke at SayAnythingBlog.com today has to do with another friend of President Mark Kennedy. Uh, somebody They worked together at one time uh, for the Shopco chain of stores. They were both executives there. Uh, they've been friends since the 1990s. Uh, this gentleman was brought to UND. Uh, he was paid uh, nearly a hundred thousand dollars in consulting fees for various projects on the campus, and also got an interim gig as the director for the Center of Innovation, being paid seventeen thousand two hundred fifty dollars a month. That works out to a little over two hundred thousand dollars a year to work part time, no more than eighty eighty hours a month, so about you know twenty hours a week, commuting from Boston, which by the way the taxpayers spent you know, right about almost $30,000 on his travel expenses, uh, commuting from Boston to UND to work part-time. Now, again, I, I don't understand how this makes any sense at all. It, this was an interim position. Uh, the gentleman uh, whose name is uh, Barry Horwitz was never going to be the full-time uh, director for the Center of Innovation. So I'm not sure why we're paying an interim director, you know, upwards of a salary on par with, with, you know, 
over two hundred thousand dollars a year, plus paying you know all the expenses to commute back and forth from Boston at a time when UND is talking about you know their budget cuts. Oh, budgets were cut, and we had to cut this, and we had to cut that, and. I mean, certainly, yes, budgets were cut at the University of North Dakota, and there was a lot of things that were cut. But if they're spending like this on these sorts of salaries, if these are the sort of, you know, personnel decisions that they're making, you've got to wonder how much more fat is left on the bone. How much more is left to be cut if this is the money that they have available to spend? Yeah, I've, I've been a critic of higher education for a long time. In fact, I, I would argue that I probably have something of a reputation for it in my region. I write about it a lot. I've been very critical of them over the years. And it's it's examples like this, which to me are exemplary of why they deserve criticism. And we're we're at a time right now where the legislature is considering uh, you know, a, a new a new governance model, right? Governor Burgum came out and he wanted a a three board model, right? Where we're gonna have UND would have their own. We would replace the current state board of higher education, which is sort of the the oversight body for the university system. We'd we'd replace the existing board with three new boards, one board exclusively for UND, one board exclusively for NDSU, and a third board for the other uh you know the other institutions in the university system. Uh, the other nine institutions in the university system. I I look at that and, you know, Governor Burgum and the other supporters of that model or, or even going to a two-board model where, you know, the, the two big universities, NDSU and UND, would be under one board and the rest would be under a second. You know, th- their argue is, well, it's the university system's too large for the one board that they have now to oversee. Therefore, uh, you know, they've, they've, they've got to have a, a much larger governance body but when I look at it, I, I look at it as just a way to avoid accountability. I, I look at it as a way to, you know, sort of give the two big universities a rubber stamp. The universities are in desperate need of accountability. They are in desperate need of oversight. We are not in a position where we need to be moving away from that. Now, defenders of the status quo at the universities, what they'll often say is that it's it's these meddling legislators and, and their politics and everything else that get in the way of higher ed, but we see what happens in the university system when they, when, when administrators are left to their own devices. And I should add here that I don't really think the problem is faculty. You know, generally, from what I've seen of fa- faculty pay, it's not out of line. It seems reasonable. Uh, if anything, I, I would argue that faculty in North Dakota is probably a little bit underpaid, if anything, and they haven't gotten raises in a while, which is not necessarily good. Now, to me, faculty are one of the reasons why the university exists. We want to employ smart people to educate our students, to produce uh, great research that can then be used to, uh, you know, further the endeavor of human knowledge and, and further industry and further business and do all those great things to illuminate our lives. I mean, that's that's one of the reasons why the universities exist. I don't think faculty are the problem, and the students aren't the problem. I think the problem on the universities is bloated administration that is trying to do too many things, and they're doing things inefficiently, and they're doing things stupidly, and just a lot of that has to stop. I am very gratified that I broke a story that led to a little bit of change at the University of North Dakota, but I'm telling you, stories like that, they're just the tip of the iceberg. That's it for today's rant. My interview with State Representative Shannon Rourke Jones next. This episode of the Plain Talk podcast is brought to you by Energy of North Dakota. Oil and natural gas from North Dakota strengthens all of America. And through our abundance of talents, innovations, and technologies, energy responsibly produced here translates to worldwide economic stability. With producers and our communities working together, we're securing a sustainable future that generation after generation can build on. It's all happening right now with Energy of North Dakota. Learn more at energyofnorthdakota.com. State Representative Shannon Roars Jones joins me. She is a Republican from Fargo. She was also the sponsor of legislation related to the decriminalization of marijuana. Now, We could get into the specifics of that bill, but essentially North Dakota has been having a lot of debates on marijuana going all the way back to the 2016 legislative cycle where uh, a a medical marijuana ballot measure passed by a wide margin on the statewide ballot. The legislature implemented it. And in fact, I think in just a few days, the state's going to see its first medical marijuana dispensary. 
open for business. And there's a lot of other communities ar- across the state that are going to be getting uh, similar dispensaries. But in 2018, the debate turned to recreational marijuana. There was a statewide ballot measure. It was called Measure 3. The organization behind it was called Legalize ND, sort of a, a, a grassroots collection of of, uh, of of local activists assisted by some some national um, uh, marijuana activists as well but they uh you know they made their argument uh their measure failed but part of that debate was some people saying hey let's go to the legislature let's see if we can at least agree if not on legalization but on decriminalization now j- just to be clear what those terms means legalization means it's not illegal at all it's in fact legal you can use marijuana and that's just fine decriminalization essentially says well it's illegal but we're not really going to do anything about it am i getting all that right shannon well i would say generally uh, generally yes i would say with regard to decriminalization we're not saying that it's okay that it's legal but we're not going to create a criminal record for you based on this conduct. We're going to fine you and that's it. Yeah. So that's, yeah. Okay. So that, that's essentially what it is. Now your bill came up. We're, we're actually in the crossover break right now. So uh, that's the point at which the house has dealt with, with all of their legislation for the most part. And the Senate's dealt with their legislation and the two chambers exchange their bills and begin voting on the other chambers bills. Now, uh, your bill was one of the last, in fact, I think it was second to last, if I'm remembering right, uh, bill to be cons- uh, third to last, third yeah. to last. Okay. The bill yep. to be considered by the state house before crossover. Uh, and it went down on a narrow, narrow vote and wasn't brought back for, for reconsideration. In fact, there was a procedural step taken to make sure it couldn't come back for reconsideration. And Shannon, you, you were critical of the process that led up to that. You, you didn't think that that was handled appropriately. Tell us about it. Well, I was, I was really, my criticism was how things were handled along the whole process. Um, I was surprised by the motion that was made on, um, our last Wednesday, which, um, which was a motion that was applied to all of the bills that we dealt with that day. It's called the motion to lay the bills on the table, or it's also called the clincher motion, which basically means we can't bring back any of those bills for any sort of action without a two thirds majority. So it, it basically, clinches whatever the final action is on that bill and and doesn't allow us to bring them back to work on them any further. Um, without that motion, it's very common for bills to be reconsidered after their vote. In fact, on Wednesday, um, Wednesday morning, we reconsidered three bills right away that we had voted on on um, the Tuesday prior. And on Wednesday afternoon, we reconsidered two bills that we had dealt with Wednesday morning. And all it takes for someone to reconsider a vote is for someone who was on the prevailing side to ask for that reconsideration. And so had I had some opportunity to have a little bit of a break to work some of those votes, there I think there would have been a good opportunity to flip those votes. Uh, additionally, if we had had until this week, this next week, Wednesday, when we go back into session, there was four people who were absent last week, Wednesday, when we had this vote. And I'm quite confident that at least two of those votes would have been yes votes for uh, passing the decriminalization. But prior to that, I I had frustration with the process where the bill went through committee as well. Um, we had the bill was submitted on the first day of the legislative session, so very early in the process, and it was one of the last bills to be scheduled for a hearing. Uh, we didn't have the bill scheduled until I think February 6th for a hearing. When we had the hearing, it was limited in time to 30 minutes, which is 15 minutes per side, pro and con, um, which is the only bill that came out of our committee that was limited in time as far as the hearing. And then once we were done with the hearing, when it came time to work on the bill, there were some amendments that were brought to the committee when we were working on it that were a surprise to me. They were not uh, uh, not made known to me before the time that we sat down to work on them. So that was a little bit of a challenge to overcome on the fly. Uh, and then when, when the bill was done and, and passed out of committee with a 9-4 due pass recommendation, it was held off of the calendar an extra day. So rather than being on the calendar for a vote on Tuesday, it didn't make until to the calendar until the very end of Wednesday, which really 
all of these things together just complicated our ability to get it uh, out and passed, and even if it was not passed, uh, to have that opportunity for reconsideration. Now, one thing that we often talk about with the North Dakota legislative process is that it's an open process. In fact, you'll hear lawmakers talk on the floor. I mean, sometimes they'll vote against their own bill because they'll say, listen, I don't necessarily agree with this, but I introduced it because it was a constituent bill. Uh, The idea is that every bill that's introduced in the legislature uh, gets a committee hearing and gets a vote, at least in the chamber it was introduced in. So what you're describing seems to run contrary to that spirit where bills are all the bills are are treated, you know, sort of equitably and and fairly. Why do you think it is that, that, that this happened? I mean, why was your bill singled out this way? Did you get an explanation from anybody? No, I have not received an explanation. And certainly, you know, there are different conspiracy theories and others. I don't know if, um, if there was an intentional effort by the committee chairman to um, to stifle this bill, or if it was um, if it was something related to me, I, I can't begin to guess, and I have not had a conversation with uh, with him. But it, I mean, it was just a, on Wednesday evening it, on my drive home. It was a very frustrating time for me because, you know, whether it was intentional or not, it felt like there was a lot of things stacked against this bill from the get go. I, it's hard not to see it as intentional. Now, I, I interviewed actually for the last episode of this podcast, David Owen. Now, he's one of the citizens activists who are behind Legalize ND, behind the push to uh, legalize recreational marijuana. And he, by the way, says that with the failure of his bill, they're absolutely putting another recreational measure on the ballot uh, for the 2020 cycle. Uh, but but he said, you know, his observation is that in, in this committee, in the House Judiciary Committee, uh, the civil asset forfeiture bill, for instance, got, you know, something like five hours of testimony. What you just mm-hmm. told me is that your bill was the only bill that was time limited and each side was given 15 minutes. That sure seems yeah. like this bill is being singled out in a state where, again, we've been having debates about various aspects of marijuana policy for years now. I mean, this is it's gotten a lot of media attention. This is a hot button issue. It's not like this is some. Uh, you know, fringe, you know, fringy bill that came out of nowhere and, and, you know, really doesn't have a lot of support and probably isn't going anywhere. This was a meaty bill as evidenced by the fact that it was a very narrow vote on the house floor. Uh, it almost passed. So, I mean, obviously this is controversial to hear that the committee chairman, uh, representative Kim Koppelman, Republican from West Fargo, limited debate, limited committee testimony on this. How is that not singling it out? I mean, that seems self-evident to me. Well, and, and that's the way it felt. Um, you know, I, I can't speak to his motivations. Obviously, that would be, that would be speculation on my part, but, but it's, that was, that was what led, you know, so much to my frustration on Wednesday once I recognized, um, that the bill, uh, that the bill failed, that I had no time left on Wednesday night to have any sort of a recess where I could work the votes to try and get it flipped. And then to have at the end of the evening to have that clincher motion applied to everything, but but specifically how much it impacted my ability to do something with the bill. I I mean, you understand I, this is how it feels to me, but but I can't say you know that that was the yeah. it, it was done intentionally to me. Well, yeah, uh, I, but um, I don't expect you to read other people's minds, but like the the clincher motion that you're talking, I I watch just about every uh, floor debate in the House in the Senate. Bills are brought back for reconsideration. I don't want to say all the time, but it's not unusual. I mean, it happens somewhat right. regularly. It seems like it happens, you know, maybe a half dozen to a dozen times every legislative session uh, to, to varying degrees of success. So so why why was it so important that the clincher motion? I've never I've ne- I, honestly before this, I'd never even heard of this uh, going back to 2003 when I began writing about, you know, this in politics. I've never seen this before. Well, I, I will tell you this, Rob, when I, I did have a conversation with, with the majority leader Pollard after, um, right after the bill failed and asked if he could hold the bill before I knew that the clincher was going to happen. And he said that he and the, um, minority leader had had a discussion prior to the floor session that they would not be holding anything over. Um, and then I also uh, had a conversation with him this last weekend just kind of talking through the process and, and saying, 
um, and getting some more information. I understand now that the majority leader had always intended to have everything from this session tied up and, and not carried over. So I, I'm feeling a little bit better about that process, uh, that there was other people who knew of this intent before it happened. It doesn't feel as much in that instance like it was applied specifically for the purpose of defeating my bill. But at the same time, there, I mean, there's a lot of things that happen through throughout the process in the committee that that still make me feel that this bill was not treated in the same way that the other bills were treated. Um, like you mentioned, civil asset forfeiture, that bill was also on our calendar scheduled for a 30 minute hearing. And the first day had about two and a half hours of testimony. And then we held it uh, and came back another day for some other people who wanted to test, wanted an opportunity to testify. And we ended up having, I think, almost two and a half hours of testimony the second day that we right. had hearings on it. As well, we should. And I mean, so, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's an important, very nuanced area of public policy. There's a lot of strong feelings on both sides of it. It, that bill was worthy of, of that amount of debate. And, and again, I understand you guys only have so much time down there. You can't give hours and hours of debate to every single bill that comes before your committee. But uh, it seems like the important ones could, and, and this is one that was important to a lot of people. I, I just, again, I'm, and I, I know you don't have an explanation for it. I'm just left scratching my head why this was done this way. I I, I do agree with you, Rob. I, it uh, it was something that along along the way I struggled to understand why this bill would be limited to a half an hour of testimony. Um, and why things were handled in the way that they were so that it wasn't submitted to the calendar uh, to be on the calendar on Tuesday, but instead didn't make it to the calendar on until Wednesday. Um, but, you know, and I, and I've spoken also, like you said, with David Owen related to this. I know he traveled that that hearing was on a Wednesday morning at 830 in the morning and he traveled from Grand Forks. He left at like three o'clock in the morning and was only able to testify for about five minutes because, you know, in that 15 minutes that we were given, I had to introduce the bill, which I tried to do as quickly as possible. And then David testified. And I think there was one or other two, one or two other people who were able to, to say a little bit about their position. And then we were done with the, with the proponent sides. And there was one person who got up and took an opposition. And then we were able to go back to a couple more people who testified in favor of it. But there were people there who either didn't get to testify at all or really had to abbreviate the things that they wanted to say so that they could try and make sure that they didn't take all of the time. Um, it, I mean, it's not uncommon for one person to get up and testify for 15 minutes. Where was opposition to this coming from? I mean, that's the other thing I don't understand is I, I don't. I, I, you would expect opposition to this to maybe come from law enforcement, maybe come from the attorney general's office, but generally it seemed like they were all pretty much on board with this. I mean, this this seemed like you know some some compromise legislation that the proponents of legal marijuana and the the proponents of keeping it illegal a little bit of middle ground that everybody seemed to agree on. I honestly thought your bill was going to sail through. I didn't think it was going to have. I didn't think it was going to have any problems. You know. I, I'm glad you thought so. I, I kind of was along the same line, too. And I'm recognizing that I certainly should have talked to more of my my representatives, my co-legislators individually to make sure that they really understood the why behind this bill. Um, the one person who testified in opposition was um, uh, he came. I believe he testified on his own behalf, but he was a, a narcotics investigator from Morton County. Uh, and so he, uh, his opposition was that this was going to create more diversion, um, that, uh, that people would be, I, I think that it would be more opportunity for drugs to be, you know, uh, sold illegally. I'm not sure what the, I, I didn't totally follow his rationale, but that was the one person who testified in opposition. Yeah. Now, is, is this, this issue's dead now? I mean, there's no chance it could get amended into another bill or anything like that. Well, this bill is dead. This bill um, is dead. Okay. Now, whether or not whether or not we have opportunity to put uh, some language somewhere else is yet to be seen. Um, I don't want to say that we can do it, but we're looking at opportunities to see um, if there are if there are some aspects or some elements that can be incorporated elsewhere. the The process 
or I'm sorry, the problem with that is it it really depends on you don't want to you don't want to put it someplace where it doesn't make sense and you don't want to put it somewhere where it's going to negatively affect something else that's that's important. Yeah. And so there's I mean there's a lot of different elements to look at, but the I mean the thing that I think is important for people to recognize is now without this bill, like you said, the the legalization group is is full speed ahead with their legalization efforts and they've already uh, commented that they're going to come back this next election cycle with a much more uh, limited, much more nuanced bill that's not going to be shooting for the moon like they did in 2018. You know, in 2018, I talked to a lot of people and actually I debated David Owen a couple of times. Um, I opposed, you know, he was obviously in favor of the, the measure three legalization bill and I was opposed to that. Uh, but a lot of the people who I talked to who were non marijuana users said, I, you know, I don't have any intention of using marijuana, but I'm going to vote for this bill because I don't agree with the criminal uh, consequences that people have, yeah. for, you know, e- either in the past for having used marijuana or in the future for using a small amount in the future. And that's why I had the two bills that I had. One was the record ceiling one uh, that did pass. And the second bill was the decriminalization. And I thought with those two things together, we can really take care of a lot of these issues that people have related to legalization. Um, And now without that passing, I think the legalization bill stands a much stronger chance of passing because they're going to have a more limited bill and we don't have a resolution to these problems that the non-users were looking for. Well, what David, what David told me is he said the legislature has communicated their unwillingness to have an adult conversation about marijuana. Now, obviously he's feeling a little bitter about the way this was handled, but do you, do you agree with that? Um, maybe not quite in as strong a terms, but I mean, I think what we're seeing here is an issue that we've seen in the past is where the, the public, says to the legislature, we want you to do these things, and the legislature kills uh, whatever the legislation is, whether it's related to medicinal marijuana, whether it's related to ethics reform, uh, the the legislature fails to act on those sorts of things, and we end up with an initiated measure that passes. Yeah, well, that's true, and uh, I'll tell you, I mean, I don't like the initiated measure, but this is a topic for a whole other show I, i'm not a fan of the initiative measure oh. process i think it's a i think it's a poor way to make public policy and i would rather the legislature address these issues because i think the process is more rigorous and, and better suited for it uh, for producing good policy outcomes but in this instance man i i think they missed the boat um but shannon i appreciate your time talking about this absolutely thanks for reaching out to me i appreciate the opportunity to to share my experience That's it for today's Plain Talk podcast. Remember, new episodes come out right away in the morning, weekday mornings. If you want to subscribe to the podcast, you can search for us. uh, Search for Plain Talk with Rob Port on the podcasting service of your choice. Now, if you ever have any troubles finding it or if you want to give any feedback on the show, if you want to send in questions for Senator Kevin Kramer or Congressman Kelly Armstrong, who appear on the podcast every week to answer those questions, email all of that to Rob at SayAnythingBlog.com or Just send me a message to say hi. I like it when people say hi. Thanks for listening. We'll talk again.